he was clutching his chest as though he might be injured internally. After hauling him out of the range of the gas tanks in case they should have exploded, I picked up the mechanic who seemed to be in equally great pain and had blood streaming down his face. It was several minutes before the other two airmen whom we had left on the ground when we started and the crowd of Spaniards got to us. They were about a quarter of a mile away. At first, the country folk stood around wide-eyed, apparently too frightened to offer any help. They acted too as if it was all part of a show that they had come to see. Our throats were choked with the dust and sand that had flown up over us. I tried to get the peasants to go for water. Each one shouted to the other to do it and no one did anything. But the chief of pilots and his mechanic, who had come up a few minutes later after the others, went off at a run. As each minute passed, the injured mechanic who had been sitting in the rear cockpit with his knees interlocked in mine grew weaker and weaker. His face began to puff up. Both eyes were swollen completely shut. I stretched him out in the shade of one of the smashed wings. The gasoline had emptied into the sand by now and there was no longer any danger of an explosion. For the first 5 or 10 minutes after the crash, I felt no effects from it except that I was covered from head to foot with a layer of dirt. Apparently none of my bones had been broken and I was not cut. I had been too busy vainly trying to do something for my far less fortunate companions to think of anything else. But now that the crowd had gathered around and the other two airmen had gone in search of water, things began to swim before my eyes and I crumpled up for a bit. Sven Haydn had given me in Stockholm a copy of my life as an explorer. And the night before, in that little inn near the Marseille airport, I had been reading the thrilling chapter of where he had got lost in the Central Asian desert and the horror of those days when they struggled across the sand dunes without water and food and half dead. He had lost hope of getting out alive and as he grew weaker and weaker, he counted his own pulse as a scientist might watch the development of some laboratory experiment. I did the same and it was certainly doing the double quick, almost too fast to count. Then the aches and pains started to develop, but at the same moment I felt a curious glow of exhilaration. I was hilarious and wanted to laugh, laugh in that idiotic way I had on another occasion when a dose of gas knocked me out on the Italian front. And when I looked over at the plane and saw how completely wrecked it was, I wanted to do a highland fling for joy. It seemed too good to be true. Incredible in fact that any of us could have been in that smashed up and climbed out of that crumpled up pile of wood and metal alive. The shock had smashed the tail assembly and broken the fuselage as you would snap a stick over your knee. The wings were crushed and twisted. The undercarriage had been flattened out as though there had never been any. The mail and the baggage compartments, shaped like torpedoes and suspended from the lower wing, had been smashed to smithereens. And the Moroccan mails were scattered all over the scene. Of course, the propeller had vanished into thin air, all except a piece about 18 inches long that I had brought away as a souvenir. Even the engine had broken into two and lay there ready to be scrapped. Although we supposed that the pilot had cut off the engine, it still whined as the last few drops of gasoline trickled into the sand. Every part of that budget mail plane was demolished except the two cockpits. Fortune had certainly smiled on us, for our escape was about as miraculous as any escape could be. Our smash was the same sort of thing that had happened to Commander John Rogers. When you go into a nosedive at 300 feet above the earth, there is no chance whatever to straighten out your plane and generally you are in for it. You could not blame me for feeling happy. Had I been alone, I would have danced for joy, but the sufferings of my two companions checked that. While waiting for the water to come, I took several snapshots of the smash. When the crash came, I happened to be holding my heavy Graflex camera on my lap so it suffered very little damage from the shock. But no ale hat and the mechanic looked so miserable that I did not humiliate them by taking their pictures too. In a little while, the Alicante mechanic with his big bandana handkerchief tied over his head like an Arab chief arrived with an earthen jar full of water. 
We poured some of it down the throat of the injured mechanic who was unconscious. A motherly Spanish peasant woman moistened her apron and held it against his throbbing forehead and washed the blood off his face. We piled the scattered mails into a heap. Then, in a springless Spanish cart drawn by two ponies, we were hauled across the desert and over a bumpy road to the little town of Alcantrilla in the province of Murcia, about 50 miles inland from Cape Palos and the seaport of Cartagena. I had ended my jaunt from Paris to Fez in a lonely valley between two ranges of the Sierra Nevada mountains in Andalusia, land of the Moors and within an hour's of flight of ancient Granada. In Alcantrilla, they took us to the only hotel, a little two-storied Spanish inn called the Hospedeje y Casa de Comillas, where they gave us each a drink of cognac and a bed. Several Spanish doctors came, dressed my companions' wounds, closed their shutters to darken the rooms and forbade anyone to enter. That was the last I saw of them. I left them in the hands of the chief of pilots from Alicante. It was fearfully hot in Alcantrilla. I found it difficult to sleep because of new bruises that were turning up. So, I caught a night train for the cool upper regions of the Sierra Nevada. Some months later, I received a letter from Noel Hat. He had recovered and all but forgotten the crash. The mechanic got well too. That was the first trip on which my wife did not accompany me. I wonder if she had been the mascot until then. At any rate, I am glad she missed that crash and glad that we happened to have it in a remote corner of Spain where no news of it could have spoiled her shopping in Paris. And that was the end of the story, A Crash in the Mountains by Lowell Thomas. Hope you enjoyed it. And as we come to the end of that story, we come to the end of this episode too. So, see you in the next one. 